Okay, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's very nice to see all of you here. Um, to hear Carlotta Gardner, Dr. Carlotta Gardner, give her paper today, which is the culmination, not the culmination, but a, a interim report on a whole range of different projects that she's been working on that she's been pulling together in different ways. But before I talk a little bit more about that, um, we'll mention that one of the very few positives about COVID for me has been the fact that many of the upper house seminars that should have taken place over the last couple of years weren't able to, weren't, they weren't able to take place over the last few years. And so we've been having the opportunities now to have upper house seminars that were outstanding. And it's a real pleasure to be able to hear Carlotta um, talk about her work. Carlotta is uh, a member of the Fitch Laboratory, but she started out as a school student in 2017, 2018, where uh, she did amazing work as a school student and kind of set the standard for school student -y jobs. Well, none, of, none of the current school students are here to be mocked like this. Um, but she um, was a fantastic school student. And because of her work, she then became Williams Fellow 2018 to 2021, 22, sorry, COVID just merges some years. Um, and then she has uh, been appointed recently as the research and outreach officer for the Fitch 2024 anniversary, which um, promises a huge amount of really interesting knowledge exchange and outreach events, uh, in addition to um, academic events concerning the um, um, marking of the Fitch anniversary. Um, what Carlotta is talking tonight about, though, is not necessarily the work of her PhD, which was on crucibles um, in Britain um, to do with uh, uh, Roman work. I think you said that you worked on Hadrian's Wall a bit and um, areas like that. So she, she moved to Greece um, uh, kind of with the idea that she could potentially look for similar evidence in Greece, um, but her project has quickly morphed into this much greater project uh, concerning uh, ceramic production in uh, the north, northern Peloponnese concerning particular uh, Corinth and Sicyon. And in those projects, she works um, on a much earlier period, um, seventh, sixth, fifth century, um, but also with a huge range of people too. So she's bringing together uh, people such as the Danish uh, Institute, people that work on Corinth, the Corinthia Ephoria, and people that work on Sicyon as well. And you're going to hear a lot more about that work. Um, so, Carlotta also is one of the best speakers, no pressure, <laughs> most engaging speakers, no pressure, that I've heard uh, in some time. And so I'm, you're in for a real treat tonight with her seminar. So thank you very much, Carlotta. Well, I hope I can, uh, yeah, entertain you in the way that Rebecca seems to think is possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, like Rebecca said, this research was um, the work that was done as Williams Fellow when I um, was at Fitch in 2018-2022. It is a huge project and it's still ongoing. Um, it's grown um, and, as you will see, there are lots of different aspects to it. And this was a, a nice way of trying to bring some of that together a little bit, although I can't promise everything in one 45-minute uh, presentation. So... Let's see how to... No? <laughs> Don't seem to be able to change slides. No. Sorry. Ah, okay. So I wonder if I just come out of it. With the source space. Or with the, the mouse. No. <laughs> oh, very edge of the slide. How do I get rid of this thing again? I've managed to. Uh, do we know? Sorry. <laughs> But how do I get rid of the bottom bit again? It wasn't there a second ago. I think it'll. 
disappear eventually. Mm -hmm. Just start the presentation, it will, it will disappear. Thanks, uh, right, let's try this. This is a test to see how I scale the best of obstacle, obstacle. Anyway, um, so tonight we will uh, cover a short um, history of research in the area, particularly focusing on the scientific um, analysis of ceramics. Then moving on to studying ceramic landscapes and what they are, how we do it, and why we do it. And then I'm going to present almost three mini kind of presentations um, on three case studies. One is the um, exploration that we've been um, working on with the clay raw materials, so the raw materials in the um, Corinth and Sikion region. And then I'll present to you um, collaborative projects which uh, cover archaic and classical loom weights from Corinth and also classical Sikionian fineware pottery production. And then we'll bring it all together with the archaeological implications and the preliminary conclusions. So I don't imagine anybody needs to know where Corinth is, but just in case you aren't aware, Corinth is in the northern Peloponnese um, and Sikion is just above it, um, a little bit further along the coastline. Corinth, as I'm sure you all know, has a really long and rich history of study. Um, the widespread archaeological investigation, um, particularly in Corinth, started in 1896 and has continued through to modern day. So as you could imagine, we have a huge amount of results from this um, and a lot of very interesting information. Um, Corinth, as I said, is the most extensively studied site in the region, um, though more recently we're seeing this spread to other sites in the northern Peloponnese, which is really um, enriching our understanding of the region as a whole and, um, and providing us opportunities to explore things like ceramic production um, more generally. And there's always been a really strong emphasis on pottery studies um, with the work that's been completed at Corinth and now elsewhere. And this is obviously for many reasons, including that ceramics are obviously um, they survive in the record. So we have huge amounts of them, but also this region was incredibly famous kind of um, across the Mediterranean and further afield for its ceramic production. So this is kind of a basic, this isn't disappearing, is there any way? It's not on the main screen, on the screen that we have. Okay, it's just for you guys, sorry. <laughs> um, Anyway, oh, okay, so this is a timeline of, let's just move this one down a little bit better, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is a timeline of the archaeological, um, the scientific analysis of archaeological ceramics. So all the publications that have happened from Corinth. Um, and you can see that the work started incredibly early in the 1940s. So the earliest publication is in 1942. And this is really remarkable. This was in the, with the stages where archaeological science was in its very early stages. And we were really just starting to see the um, kind of emergence of it and its use in um, studying things like ceramics. Then you can see this huge expansion of work in the 1980s when we're really starting to see the development of the, the field and a more kind of, um, it becomes slightly more standardized practice to perform such techniques and such analysis. And then we start to see a, a growing interest in the um, 2010 um, period. And I think the 2020s and 2030s are going to see a huge <laughs> boom in publications again, um, not just from ours, but also there are a number of people working in the region on a whole range of really interesting um, production sites and questions. In comparison, this is Sikyon. You can see um, that we are really starting to see this trend of how we're only um, beginning to see the publication and the work of, um, the, ex the archaeological excavation and um, in this area expanding outside of Corinth. And so we're starting to see this development outside of the um, Corinth site itself. Um, and most of this is connected to Yanis Lolos's um, survey project and his more recent excavations um, in the area as well. So just to give you an idea of some of the trends that we're seeing in the literature, um, which is something that we worked on and was a really interesting process as part of a review paper for um, work that's been done in the region. We're seeing a real focus on fine wares. So this is the study of ceramic, um, archaeological ceramics with scientific um, methods. So we're seeing a real focus on fine wares and amphora. 
Um, this isn't that surprising, they're high status and for travel. So this is something that we're seeing, um, you know, it's a trend to focus on these things generally. We are seeing um, this peak in, you can't really see, but so sorry. This is, oh, this is fine where this column here, <laughs> I'm gonna have to tell you because you can't see it. This is um, the amphora and this is the glazed pottery. And this is mainly from one PhD thesis by Harriet White. And so this is really um, a huge study. And that's why we're seeing this peak. Otherwise there aren't actually many studies. These, these two are made up of a number of studies, whereas this is just one. And then we have the cooking pottery and then all of this coarse kind of utilitarian stuff that people don't have previously not been as interested in. <laughs> um, and we've slightly changed this picture. We've um, been working on fineware, but we've really been focusing on a lot of courseware pottery as well, and things that people have not necessarily focused on in the past. We're also seeing, so by period, we're seeing, um, again, I'll have to tell you, but the, um, the real peaks here, so this is the archaic, this is classical, and then these are the studies that overlap the two. So you were seeing a huge um, kind of emphasis on the archaic and classical period. Um, and this is not, unsurprising as this is the period where pottery production is most famed in the region. Um, the Byzantine period again is this one particular study. And then out of interest mainly for me maybe, I don't know, but a number of papers employ multi-analytical techniques and this is something that we kind of encourage now and wasn't as popular in the past but so many of them um, from the 1980s onwards have done so. So we're seeing really important kind of work happening in the field um, and we can see the development of the field through this, these studies. Um, petrography is by far the most used technique, which is wonderful for us. Um, and neutron activation analysis is the most common technique for elemental analysis. And I think this is to do with the issues that we'll cover later where we're um, seeing it's very difficult to differentiate between these um, pottery production regions. And neutron activation analysis basically gives us the most information out of all of these techniques. But why has there been so much attention in Corinth um, and the region? Well, there's obviously a high density of long-lived sites, Corinth being one of them, um, and a number of these have developed into um, local or regional craft production and trading centers, and they obviously had really far-reaching uh, long-distance connections. And this is likely because of the geography of the area, which provides amazing communication and transportation opportunities. Um, and what we're seeing is this kind of, this uh, dominating kind of, the currents dominating the market. And so we're seeing the pottery everywhere. And so people are naturally interested in understanding where this material came from and how we can confirm such things. I think one of the other issues, and particularly with the, um, or one of the attractions, let's say, um, to the Northern Peloponnese for at least archaeological scientists is this, I've said problem here, but I'm tempted to say mystery um, of the Northern Peloponnese. And this is a, an incredibly simplified geological map of um, the Northern Peloponnese. And this um, mustardy yellow is the, um, is the marl bed. So this is the, um, as we'll I'll explain later what marl is, but this is what we find the clay in. And as you can see, it runs across the entire Northern Peloponnese, making it very difficult to differentiate between something that was made in Corinth and something that was made in Patras, for example. And I think this is kind of, you know, a little bit of a mystery and a bit exciting and can I solve this? I think that might be part of the, um, the excitement around this as well. So what we decided to do at the Fitch is to revisit ancient ceramic production in Northern Peloponnese. And the Fitch has an incredibly long um, standing connection with this region and particularly Corinth, starting from its earliest days with um, Richard Jones, but then most famously with um, Ian Whitbread and his book that's kind of become the Bible for petrographers um, and the work on the uh, Corinthian production. Um, so over the past four years, and now you'll realize why I'm only presenting a couple of case studies. Um, we have worked on a whole series of different collaborative projects. Um, today we'll be presenting um, two of them, um, but it includes the Finding Old Sicyon project, um, the Hellenistic and Roman Sicyon um, work that Yanis Lolos and others have been working on. We've been collaborating with them. Um, I've been working with Bella on Bella de Mova, the previous Leventis uh, fellow on archaic and classical loom weights in Corinth. Um, with Alexandra Villing on uh, classical mortaria, and then also with a whole range of people on the raw materials of the region. So you can see why I've reduced it down to two, otherwise we'd be here all night. Um, 
But with this new work, we're hoping to investigate a number of questions about the broader region. So moving away from this kind of very heavy emphasis on currents. Um, and so there were multiple production sites across um, this region. We're finding kilns all the way along this region that I've just shown you. Um, and it's very difficult to distinguish the products, but we're kind of starting to look at that um, and trying to understand the local, the regional and the wider trading networks. Um, but we're also interested in uh, trying to understand the organization of production on a site-by-site -site basis through um, and through to a regional basis. So what's happening as a whole? Are we seeing individual sites producing specific pottery? Are we seeing um, different um, uses of raw materials um, and really trying to investigate it on a kind of a bigger um, scale? Um, we are also placing emphasis, as I mentioned, on slightly different types of ceramic products. Um, so these include the coarse utilitarian ob objects from the region, so things like mortaria and loom weights, which have been studied um, typologically and very extensively, but have never been um, subjected to um, scientific analysis. Um, and these, importantly, have actually also been found across the Aegean and Mediterranean. So it's not just the fine wares that were being exported, it's also these utilitarian objects, including even roof tiles. Another addition um, to why we're interested in these objects is that many were produced at the tile works. And until recently, these, um, the material from the tile works in Corinth was not available for analysis, but now is. So we're able to begin to characterize this material. Um, and also with the loom weights, we're able to explore evidence of cross craft interaction, which is a, a specific interest to me. So what do we mean by studying ceramic landscapes? The ceramic landscape approach um, has been developed over the past 50 years at the Fitch. Um, and it's perhaps, I think, more extensively been um, developed with um, the work of Vangelio, our director. And it aims at reconstructing um, the technology of archaeological pottery in the context of the landscape. So really um, looking at it in a much more holistic way, looking at um, how potters were using their landscapes um, and interacting with them. And it's resulted in a really extensive understanding of the geology and the resources of different regions in Greece. And I think one of the best examples or one of the examples that highlights this um, method as, um, as a really positive one is the work um, by Vangelio on um, Colonna in, in Egina. So it was a massive project that she worked on and interacted with potters from the islands, from the island, sorry, and was able to reconstruct the recipes that they were using in the past through communication with the potters and the landscape. And you can see how this all starts to kind of come together in a really um, fascinating way, as well as recording our current um, ceramic kind of landscapes and, and the way they exist today. And this led to some really ex exciting discoveries um, about, for example, craftspeople mobility. And so this led to um, the work by Bartek Liss on um, his mobility of craftspeople. Um, and so it really opens up a whole range of different questions um, that are quite exciting. So moving on to, let's say the first part of this, <laughs> um, the results of this presentation. Um, this is the clay raw materials, um, and I'm starting with this because I think it's important to understand these materials and the context before moving on to the archaeological material. I think normally you'd probably do it in reverse, but I think this is important for everybody's understanding of the material. So this, as I said, is um, uh, everything here is collaborative, and um, I'm trying to um, give credit to the people that have worked on it. Um, it's certainly not just my work. Um, so the geology of the region, as I, region, as I mentioned, is... Um, very homogenous. It's all this kind of marl, as we um, describe it as in geological terms. But it's a very common misconception, and it's something that I thought and Vangelio thought before we really started working extensively on this area, is that the region is covered in clay. And actually what it is, is marl. And marl is a fine-grade carbonate sediment, which is, like I said, everywhere. And these outcrops of marl, so you'll drive along the road on your way to Corinth and further along, and you'll see these um, this basically just mal, 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 mal all the way down. It's just, it's just how it is. Um, and these outcrops include a range of different materials. So they're not completely homogenous, but we're seeing um, that they include limestone, sandstone, coal beds, and importantly for us, clay. So we're seeing pockets of clay in these um, areas. And secondly, the mal is also often topped with um, terra rossa, which is also a dark red soil. And you can see in this, um, section through, you've got the marl at the bottom and this red clay material at the top. And this could also have been used by potters. 
So just to give you a kind of a background, raw materials have also been very extensively studied. Um, there have been over 262 clay samples collected, which is huge um, over the period between 1970 and 2022. Um, the majority of them really focus on trying to find the source of the clay that was used to produce this buff pottery that we see in, in Corinth. And all have come across exactly the same problem. The material is simply too calcareous, it has too much calcium in it, and it disintegrates into dust when fired over 900 degrees centigrade. So we have a problem here. We supposedly have clay everywhere, but we don't have any suitable materials for making pottery. And equally, it's also not chemically consistent with the archaeological pottery. The calcium content is almost double what the archaeological pottery is. So we're really seeing um, a number of issues with this area. What we've decided to do is instead of trying to identify a specific location is to focus on identifying and reconstructing the chain operatoire, so the production kind of model that the potters might have used in the past. So we've been experimenting with different treatments such as um, docking, aging and refining, and I'll explain these in a second. We will focus on um, in the future looking at mixing of different clays and also with tempering and all of this will change the um, the performance of the clays and the, the composition of them as well. And then we're monitoring the results through various observations and with petrography and elemental analysis to go alongside our archaeological pottery. So we have taken 36 samples from across Corinth and Sikion. They mix uh, between both the red clays and the white clays. Um, there's been, as I said, a very much a focus on the, the white clays. So this is quite um, a new kind of entry into the red clays and it's been very interesting. Um, we've produced over 400 experimental briquettes, so I spent an awful lot of time and that's what I did in the lockdowns. Um, and we've created this very standardized lab procedure to fire everything um, at, um, so we produce multiple briquettes of each clay, we fire them at 700, 900 and 1050 degrees centigrade to understand how the clays behave at different temperatures. What we've been doing that's different perhaps to other studies is looking at how these clays were treated in the past. And this is something um, that we see across Greece and further afield. And this is soaking, or as potters say, docking, where the pots are removed from the kiln um, after firing. So they're, they're cool, you can pick them up with your hands, but they're still quite warm. Um, and they're submerged into water for a couple of hours and up to 24 hours. And this is um, an image from Margaritas from the pottery course, the Knossos pottery course. This is a potter who uses this method today. They do it Thraxano as well with the, um, the pithoi. Um, and basically the idea is that it prevents the pitting of calcareous ceramic bodies. So with the, um, one of the issues is that the, the, the body of the pot basically kind of almost gets like little pock marks and um, spots coming out of it. So some of the early observations that we've made with this method is that some of the samples turn to lime mortar, basically. They just disintegrate in the water. Um, the water turned a whole range of different colors, which was quite interesting. We've had purple and yellow. Um, and we've also seen the precipitation of calcium carbonate so we've, um, and lower calcium contents when we analyze it with WDXRF. So we're starting to see possibilities of how we're lowering the calcium content. And ultimately more of them survived than the previous untreated examples, which is really exciting. Um, this is just to show you the um, examples of, I don't know how well it shows up, but we have some purple water, <laughs> some yellow. And in the top uh, right, we have the example where we're starting to see the calcium carbonate that's kind of precipitating out of these, um, these briquettes. So moving on to aging, aging again is a very common practice by potters. It's supposed to improve the workability or plasticity of the clays. And a number of people have suggested that this is a possible method of improving the performance of the clays in this region. So I aged the clays for six months um, and they were fired again at 900 degrees and 1050 degrees um, to see how these objects, these um, briquettes behaved. And I would agree with the fact that most of the clays were more plastic. They were definitely um, easier to work with. But what we saw that was interesting is higher vitrification stages than the unaged clays. And this means that they were basically turning, almost melting a little bit earlier, turning to glass a little bit earlier um, than the previous ones. So something is happening, but we overall don't see much of a change in terms of the performance. They all still disintegrate and there's a problem there. Refining, and this is hot off the press, it's happened only in the last two weeks, <laughs> um, is the refining of clays um, through sieving or levigation is again something that potters do across 
everywhere. <laughs> um, and what I did is I sieved the clays to um, basically a silt size, so an incredibly fine um, clay. And these again were fired at the same temperatures. And what's interesting here is that the clays were again more plastic. The colors were very different to the um, unrefined uh, ceramics and almost all of them have survived. So this is really, really interesting um, and something that we need to continue experimenting with um, in the future. Um, sadly, the calcium content didn't uh, change, but almost all of them have survived, which is very, very interesting. So just to give you kind of an overview um, of how these have worked, you can just see the kind of the, in blue, you can't see it because of the screen, sorry. In dark blue, we have the ones that have survived. The red is the failed some examples and the um, gray ones are these ones that kind of pretty much survive, but they have issues with. And you're seeing that although we haven't completed the examination of every single um, ref refined clay, we're seeing already that we have 12 that have survived, whereas in the past we only had seven. So this is really, really interesting for us and something that we need to explore. So what are the archaeological implications of this? Well, I think it's kind of it goes without saying that very few clays are suitable for potting without any processing or treatment. So you can't just go to your back garden and pick out clay and make a pot. It almost always needs something doing to it. And it's very likely that the potters working in this region treated their clays in some way. There is currently no fix all solution. I think there's potentially a combination of things happening. And as we'll come to later, perhaps also clay mixing. So this is the next steps of um, our work in terms of the raw materials. We hope to be investigating clay mixing and tempering to kind of bring this um, all together. So now moving on to uh, loom weights, um, which is a wonderful project that I've been working on with Bella. Um, and um, it's been really fantastic working with her um, on the kind of crossing our two specialisms and looking at the same time at cross craft interaction. Um, so some of this work is definitely Bella's work, <laughs> um, and so I just want to kind of acknowledge that from the outset. So Corinthian pottery industry, as we've talked about, very important, um, moved all the way around um, the Aegean and further afield. Um, there are two major production sites that we know about in the archaic and classical period. And these are the tile works and the potter's quarter. And the tile works um, were making on a whole, more um, objects that were made by mold. Um, so architectural ceramics, mortars, sculptures, and loom weights. Whereas the potter's quarter were producing um, finer material um, uh, with the wheel. And so this is something that we wanted to work on and try and start to understand the tile works a little bit better, because as I mentioned before, it's not been um, subjected to very much um, analysis at all, scientific analysis. Um, in comparison, the Corinthian textile industry, we have evidence, um, we, obviously limited evidence because textiles don't survive in the archaeological records. So we have to rely on objects like tools, such as loom weights or spindle whorls. And Bella has worked um, to record as many of the loom weights as possible. There are 1,300 loom weights inventoried at Corinth. There are more, um, but these are the ones that have been inventoried. They come from a whole range of deposits, including um, production sites like the, the tile works, but also domestic and ritual. Um, they date from the proto-geometric through to the Hellenistic period, and this industry was much more on a domestic level than pottery, and was very much um, a female-led um, role. So what we've done is combine textile archaeology and ceramic technology to really begin to explore these objects in more detail. Many of our methods of analysis have crossed over, um, and we've worked closely together on this throughout. Um, Corinthian loom weights have been studied in great detail in terms of their typology. We're very lucky that this work's um, been done and Bella has been able to build on this. Um, so there's a whole range of publications dating back to 1948 and forthcoming work um, by Nancy Bukidis as well. Um, so we have a very um, useful um, typology and we're seeing here that basically they it get bigger over time. They get heavier and bigger over time. And this is important when we think about the production of textiles. So the um, size and weight of the loom weight really impacts the coarseness of the textile itself. So we're seeing the, and Bella correct me if I'm wrong, the smaller, um, um, lighter uh, loom weights producing finer fabrics and the heavier ones producing this much coarser fabric as you see at the top here. Um, the majority of these appear to be mold made. Um, and this is confirmed, 
sadly, you can't see our beautiful new at the bottom, but they are a set of 26. Um, they all have this cockerel stamp on them, um, and they were found in the tile works, dumped in the tile works, so they're potentially wasted, so we're not entirely sure why, but... Um, and you'll have to believe me when I say that every single one of them has this tiny little um, kind of defect bump here. And we think that these are very likely made from the same mold. Um, so we're very much in agreement with the literature that says that these were made um, by mold. The bevel, so this bit at the bottom um, here was likely trimmed by hand. And there are suggestions that it was done on the wheel, but it's certainly not part of the molding process as it varies slightly. The suspension hole was then poked through and they were made in sets. So this is a set of 26 along the bottom. And another macroscopic observation that we, um, we observed was that the fabrics shift from this very fine fabric through to a like, much coarser um, fabric later on. They are, um, a lot of them are marked in some way. So there are incised marks here that uh, range from different letters through to symbols. And these seem to be associated with the tile works. And we think that they're potentially marking sets of loom weights for workers, for um, textile workers. We also have um, gem and ring stamps. Um, and these are kind of consist of about 33% of the stamped examples. Um, this kind of uh, tradition, let's say, continues post tile work. So it continues after the tile works um, stops producing. Um, and again, we're thinking these are marking sets, but we're wondering whether this is um, the potter marking them or the consumer. So as the consumer coming along and saying, these are the ones that I want and marking them, or are they saying, I would like a set of weights in this, um, you know, this weight um, and marking them um, for their own personal use. And then lastly, we have these name and then loom weight stamps. So you can see there are a whole range of different, um, we have stamps of showing a loom weight. So the loom weights are stamped with loom weights. Um, and then we have a whole range of name stamps um, along the bottom here. Again, you can't see it, I'm sorry. Um, which we think are maker or workshop kind of marks. So is this a form of branding? Um, these, as I said before, are traded. This isn't something that just stays in Corinth. Um, Bella's been able to identify these across, um, you can see quite a wide area. Uh, we're seeing the identification of Mellis stamps in various places and the Glick as well. And then we're also seeing a number that are likely from um, Corinth region um, dotted around the, um, this map as well. So they, these are um, a price commodity that are moving outside of Corinth itself. We're also very interestingly seeing a number of imitation Corinthian loom weights. Um, and these are just some examples here. So we have, these are from um, the Athenian Agora ex excavations. And we're seeing um, this one on the left is probably the best example. It's a, um, it's made of likely Attic, the Attic red clay and then slipped with um, a buff clay to kind of imitate this impression of it being made in Corinth. And this is further confirmed by the presence of fake stamps. So we're seeing the use of glick, but spelt incorrectly or in reverse. Um, so we think that this, and, and has also been published previously, it's not our original um, <laughs> idea, but um, it's basically to um, profit on a business that's incredibly successful in Corinth. So what we decided to do was to investigate what these maker stamps potentially mean. Are these um, workshops, individual workshops? So we chose the three most common name stamps, um, Glick, Mellis and Nico. Um, and we tried to include material that covered the fine um, earlier examples through to the later course examples too. And then we added two geometric examples for comparison as these are very different and we just wanted to understand what might have been changing. Um, obviously, what we wanted to find was that Glick, Mellis, and Nico were using different paste re um, clay recipes for their loom weights and that they were separate groups. But sadly, this is not what we came across. Um, and what we actually have, and so this is the results of ceramic petrography. You can see um, you do not need to be an expert in ceramic petrography to identify that this is a lot of variation. Um, we see uh, that the majority almost 99% of them are consistent with the local geology. So they are made in this region, um, but we're seeing really kind of quite a varied um, ceramic fabric. Um, and that sadly, there is no correlation between these variations uh, with the profiles of the types of loom weights or indeed the markings that we have on them. The 
Elemental analysis also shows the same variation. Um, we're seeing this quite large cloud. Um, it's a result of maybe a mixing of clays or tempering or just very kind of a, quite a wide variation in um, compositions. Um, a few of the samples do edge away, but these are the ones that are kind of very different in terms of their petrographic um, fabric as well. Um, and we're seeing similar results to other coursewares analyzed from this region. So this includes the Mortaria, for example. And again, absolutely no correlation between the marks, profiles, chronologies, anything. We've tried everything and we can't make any groups form. So just to summarize this aspect of this talk, um, basically potters were producing loom weights for textile workers. Loom weights were exported from currents um, and production methods were relatively standardized. So although the fabrics aren't standardized, the actual production and the, um, the forms themselves are incredibly standardized. Um, sets seem to be marked by incised marks or stamps, um, and everything seems, you know, very safely from this region. But what does this mean? Well, we suggest that we're able to understand aspects of the organization of production through the um, study of the loom weights. And we perhaps are seeing an increase in demand and therefore the standardization of production. They're mold made, perhaps they're being fired in communal kilns and the stamps help to facilitate, facilitate sorry, ID. Um, and the variation of fabrics is across workshops and across, um, you know, uh, yeah, across workshops. And therefore perhaps we're seeing maybe some kind of centralized clay resource or, um, but we'll explore this a little bit later. We're seeing direct evidence of cross-craft interaction. Potters were producing loom weights for textile workers. And it appears that maybe the textile workers had some influence over the product. So they were setting weights perhaps or personalizing them with ring stamps. And importantly, we're seeing that both industries were really important contributors to archaic and classical currents, both locally and regionally. And that by the late fourth century, Corinthian textile tools were branded commodities operating in a market economy. So moving on to the last one. <laughs> um, this is a, a very big project um, that's working alongside a number of people. Um, but this particular aspect of it is working closely with um, Yorgos Yanakopoulos, who is going to be um, producing a PhD on um, this material. So um, it's been wonderful working with him. Um, he's a classical archeologist. And what we were trying to identify is whether or not we were able to differentiate between classical Sicyonian um, pottery and Corinthian um, using this landscape approach. So like I said, this is part of the Finding Old Sicyon project. And although I'll be focusing on the fine wares today, we've also worked with um, cooking pottery and also architectural um, coarse wares. Um, and these are our fellow um, collaborators. So what evidence do we have for Sicyonian pottery production? Well, pottery production has been confirmed from the third century BC to the fourth century AD. We have a range of different um, ways that we've, uh, pe people have identified this. Sarah James has concluded that um, table wear and utilitarian wear and transport amphora were being produced through an extensive study of the material. Connor Trainer and Bangalio um, were able to study um, survey material that showed that there was a, an industry specialized in coarse wares between the second and third century AD. And what we're also seeing is um, a range of kiln sites being um, discovered. So this is um, the excavations that were done only a couple of years ago. Um, and this is another project that we're working on with Yanis Lolos. Um, and this is where six kilns were discovered. They date from the Hellenistic through to Roman period. And we're seeing um, the majority of the material appears to be um, cooking wear, cooking fabric, let's say. Um, and so we have a whole load of wasters and this is um, something that we're working on um, currently. Um, until recently, there was absolutely no evidence for pottery production in the coastal plains, so for pre-Hellenistic Sikion. Um, and so with rescue excavations along the road and with the Finding on Sikion project, we've been able to, they've been able to identify a range of different um, forms of evidence. We have four kilns um, that all appear to be associated with um, a cooking fabric. So we've identified sadly only a couple of wasters. So we don't know if this was the only product from the kilns or if it was more, um, but we're seeing the production of cooking um, pottery um, in these kilns. And equally, we've also found more um, wasters found in dumps during the Finding Osikion um, project. 
So we definitely have evidence of cooking production, but do we have pottery production, a fineware pottery production in classical Sikyon? Currently we have no kilns and no wastes to suggest so, but through the very detailed and extensive work that uh, Jan, um, Jorgos has done, we um, have developed a potential way of looking at it um, where, and again, I'm really sorry, you can't see the bottom of this graph, so it's almost useless, but um, these are uh, drinking vessels. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, I'm very sorry, but basically we have various vessels um, that we used, fineware, and these are, um, have been given a provenance, they've been assigned a provenance based on their relative abundance. And of course, there are issues potentially with this. We may also be seeing um, this abundance based on consumer preference. But for the moment, we wanted to test this hypothesis. Were there um, particular forms being produced in Sikyon and those in Corinth? So what we did is we took um, 123 um, fineware samples um, that were excavated at Sikyon, and then we supplemented this with um, a further 35 samples that were excavated at Corinth. And these 35 samples are almost undoubtedly produced in Corinth. So these are almost like our little reference um, group. Um, and then in addition, we took material from cooking wares and um, coarse wares, but we won't cover that today. So like I said, we've used a ceramic landscape approach and this is the project where the clays kind of originally came from. So we took in total 221 archeological samples and then 36 clays were some, uh, collected as well. They've been subjected to macroscopic examination, WDXRF, thin section photography and early firing as well. And the, macros the results of the macroscopic analysis, which is the work that Jorgos did, he identified eight macroscopic fineware um, groups, let's say fabric groups. And um, we're seeing, it's very difficult to, uh, it's amazing that he was able to do this, <laughs> um, but I can, yeah, it's, it's great work that he's done. Um, and the refiring of small chips. So what we do in the, in the lab is we take tiny little chips off of our sampled material and we refire them in an electric furnace. So we're almost resetting the way that they've been fired because all of these different environments in kilns can change the color and, the, and various other aspects. So we're basically resetting it to try and understand the similarities between them. And this revealed a whole load of very interesting observations. We saw the same variation that Yorgos was um, seeing from the macroscopic observation, but also it revealed streaks of either yellowish white or red within a number of samples. The results of elemental analysis. So in this situation, we started with elemental analysis because the material is so fine, it's very difficult to study uh, with thin section photography. We see a huge compositional variability. Um, as you can see this, you know, ideally you'd have quite a small kind of cluster in various places, um, but here is a kind of a general um, mess, let's say. Um, and what we're seeing, unfortunately, is again, very few meaningful patterns emerge. So no matter how we color these points with um, period or, you know, more refined chronologies or types or anything, we're just not really seeing very many patterns emerge. The only thing that we do see is this um, macroscopic fabric C kind of pulling away from the group. So we were particularly interested in this. Um, and so, yes, so in terms of the ceramic petrography, we subsampled um, 79 fineware examples. And through this, we were able to identify two petrographic fabric groups. The first um, consisted of 13 samples, and these were all from that small group of 35 samples we analyzed from Corinth. And what we found was that they were very, very fine. Um, they had very few inclusions and they were incredibly consistent. Our second petrographic fabric group consisted of 66 samples, and these were from all presumed uh, provenances. And again, we see um, this variation that we're seeing in the, in the elemental analysis. So we're seeing, although everything is, I mean, it's very similar, but <laughs> when you really get your eye in, you're seeing quite a large variation in the um, frequency of inclusions. Um, and we're also seeing a lot more kind of textural concentration features. And these include things like clay pellets or streaks of different clays. So perhaps we're seeing um, evidence of clay mixing. Um, but the important thing here is just um, that it's varied. Um, sadly, macro macroscopic fabric C doesn't pull out in any of the petrographic groups. So this is something that we um, have not been able to explore further. When we combine these results, 
um, what we see is that elemental analysis and petrography are compatible. Um, the petrographic fabric one very nicely clusters in this top right hand corner of the graph, and this was quite exciting for us, of course, we have to consider the small sample size, but this is potentially something that um, is is showing as different. Um, whereas this petrographic fabric two is widely dispersed and reflects this variation that we've spoken about um, before. Um, if we have a look at the presumed provenance, we are again seeing very little assignment, uh, so, sorry, very little um, correlation between uh, any meaningful groups forming, sorry, I lost my words there. <laughs> um, but perhaps we're seeing again this slight trend of the Corinthian examples forming in this top right hand corner, but this is really, it's pushing it a little bit, but there's definitely a higher concentration of them up in the right. So again, what does this mean? And this, these scenarios that I present here, I think can be used across the region um, as, a, as a way of exploring um, the organization of production. So the results could represent a number of scenario. The first is that we have two workshops using two different clay paste recipes. So the first one is based in Corinth. It's using this um, very consistent fine wear um, uh, fabric. And these interestingly are all used for wine and perfume vessels. The second workshop is using this very mixed um, bag of clay, and it, maybe it's a Sikyon, maybe it's a Corinth, where we can't say at this point. And this is being used for drinking um, vessels, mixing, serving vessels, etc. The second is perhaps there's a single workshop that are using two different recipes for different um, forms. So the first one is again using this very um, consistent fine grain material for these kind of more prestigious objects for storing um, wine and perfume and oils. And then the second one is used for the more kind of um, utilitarian things such as drinking, mixing, serving. And then the third one is perhaps we're seeing a centralized clay preparation um, zone where potters collect their prepared materials and take them to their workshop or they're distributed to their workshops. So we're seeing um, one big kind of production of the right fabric and then it's being the right clay paste recipe. And then this is moving out to different workshops where they're making their, their preferred forms or, or whatever. Um, and I think this is really possible um, whether we can find this archaeologically or not, I don't, uh, we'll have to see, but it, it's also something that Eleni Hasaki has mentioned in terms of there's um, a lot of decentralization in the current region in terms of production. And we're, we're seeing very specialized um, units of production within the current um, ceramic repertoire. So I think it'd be really interesting to explore this further. Um, Currently, there is no clear evidence for distinct clay recipes associated exclusively with Sikion um, or Corinth workshops. Um, at present, sadly, there is no direct evidence for fine wear production at Sikion. I don't think our results can really confirm that this is happening for, for sure. And this is because also that the relative abundance may also represent um, consumer preference. And so maybe all of this material is being produced in Corinth and being um, they're just choosing specific forms at Sikion. We can't really um, rule this out at present. And so just to kind of summarize all of this and have a look at some common trends, I think this surprising variation in the ceramic fabrics from this region is is potentially quite telling. And we can use this, instead of seeing it as a negative, we can use it to really investigate different aspects of the Chena Bretois pottery. Um, and this is because nothing really correlates with um, workshops or types of pottery or, or as we've seen. And I think we have to look beyond this and start looking at resource management and um, clay kind of preparation. And so we're really focusing on this top section of the Chêne Pretoire, where we're looking at the clay procurement and the clay processing and the, the treatment of these, the tempering, the mixing, um, and really beginning to explore this aspect of it. In terms of like what it really means, in, <laughs> I think, and it's something that I know a, a number of us, not just us at the Fitch, but also um, Nancy Bukidis and others have suggested that maybe we need to start um, focusing more on this as a region rather than just simply looking at Corinth, for example. And I think the boundaries between Corinth and Sikion may have been much looser than we originally anticipated. These sites are 20 kilometers apart. This doesn't take very long, even if you're on foot to move between. And perhaps we have a whole region of ceramic production between the sites and further afield. And this technical knowledge and familiarity with the raw materials may easy, well, could easily have been shared across the region through craftspeople mobility. And this is confirmed by, or 
supported by um, Pliny, who um, speaks of a potter from Sicyon working in Corinth. So we're already seeing the mobility of craftspeople between the two sites. Um, and he also talks about how this potter potentially was also mixing clays. So this is very interesting um, for us and something that we um, need to explore further. So just final thoughts for now. Um, like I said, this is ongoing. Um, it's clearly important to combine a whole range of different lines of evidence to approach questions in this region. It's not simple to work in, um, and we need to bring in all of the archaeological evidence and scientific as well. Um, the results still do not indicate that we can separate these regions, um, and these results show the potential instead to um, look at other aspects of the industry within the region. We should be careful when assigning um, a product Corinthian or Securian uh, provenance and focus more on these regional trends that we talked about. And this is not only because of the issues of scientifically confirming or assigning provenance, but also because it's very plausible that potters were traveling between these two city states and taking their knowledge between the two. So finally, I'd like to thank, I mean, I'm not going to list this, this is <laughs> huge. Um, and I'm sorry if I've missed anybody, but we are thankful to everybody who we've worked with. It's been a, an immense pleasure for me and I know Vangelio and our team. Um, and of course, to Mr. Williams, who is um, the reason that I'm able to present this work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla. That was a superb presentation and uh, totally uh, confirmed, as I said earlier, <laughs> by her brilliantly. She, Carla, presents uh, different types of material to a uh, quite diverse audience, and um, which makes it really accessible and engaging. So, thank you very much for that. I'm sure there are lots of questions, and there are little shared nerds in the audience. Shared <laughs> nerds. Um, we can have questions from non shared nerds too. <laughs> Can I start off? Of course you can. Um, uh, our, I think you may have said that you were going to look at using two different types. So the, not drowning, what do you do with the pots? When you the soaking, the, the docking. Soaking, yeah. yeah. And say the refining. Yeah. Have you combined both of those? That's the next step. Yeah, I think it's... And do potters do it in places like Margaritas and Thraxano now? Yes, I mean, um, most potters, um, in Margaritas, for example, um, the clay is processed and in, he goes to collect his own clay. He's one of the few potters who um, continues to do so and processes it. I have never asked how, so that's something for the next um, trip. Um, and then um, soaks them afterwards so yes the combination is very very possible um it'd be very interesting to see how yeah, that yeah. behaves and it was really uh, stunning to see how different the refining which is refining, Refi yeah. Yeah. Amazing. questions from the audience i should have said bella is here so our yes <laughs> was working with Carlotta on the uh mortarium Oh, you actually have a question. Yeah, oh, I didn't just say no. Alexandra. Yeah, thank you so much. That's really brilliant. Uh, I mean, I have lots of questions, but one, one is, um, is there any evidence from contemporary potters or you know, 20th century potters perhaps that, that, that people you know, have, other people have looked at um, that might help you understand how potters dealt with the raw material yeah. in the region? I, I haven't come across any potters who directly use material from the region, but there are a number of brick production sites. And this is actually something we've been running in the last couple of weeks is a whole, um, Ian Whitbread collected a whole range of brick wasters and um, material that hadn't been fired yet. So this is something that we've um, literally just got the results from the uh, end of last week. Um, and it's very comparable to the, at least the, the elemental analysis is very similar um to the clays um and they're very they're very rich in the calcium but they i think in this situation they've actually found a really good pocket of clay and that's why we're seeing this huge mining of the area and it's something that vangelio and i and guy have maybe kind of explored the idea that maybe actually the clay resource has been exhausted from the production and um, this is something and the landscape's changed i mean this is an incredibly active zone geologically so the the landscape's changed since um the potters of the archaic and classical period so it, we're dealing with a whole range of issues but the brickworks i think are potentially um, an interesting one to look at in a little bit more detail and, and 
solve? No, no, <laughs> exactly. You'd have quite an issue <laughs> if it rained. <laughs> I love your contextualization of all the data at the beginning. It was like kind of, you know, seeing who has produced an album in every decade. Yeah. So Ian Whitbread is equated to Kim Richards, for example. Yes. Don't tell me said that. He definitely not be online. Ah. Oh, it is. Yeah. What was it yesterday? I saw it on Twitter. Yeah. Maybe it was yesterday. That's right. Uh, other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, go for it. Oh, there are lots of other questions. So, okay, I was having a lot. Okay, um, this is maybe a very quick one. The, uh, the courseware on tree from, you know, the wasters that you have or searching. Yep. We are, yes, and um, we're in the earlier stages of it, um, but it's producing some very interesting results, actually, and maybe it's something that we can present at a later date. Um, but yeah, it's it's very, we're starting to see, this is um, in the cooking wear fabric, and we're starting to see um, variation with uh, the work of other people at the Fitch as well, who are looking at the current material, we're starting to be able to separate um, these. So the cooking wear is a completely different situation and also very, very interesting, so yeah. Uh, Thank you very much for that. I'm not a nerd. <laughs> a lot of people know. The picture that you presented here was very much synchronic, and I understand that because it's part of the project, the several projects which are, are ongoing. Are you yet at a point where you can talk about change over time? That is, is what your sketch is, the view that your sketch is that sort of package? repeatedly over time or does it change over period is what's going on later different from what's going on earlier and so on and so forth I think sadly we're a little bit too early for this um but it's and and because of the varied material as well it's difficult to comment on a general trend when we're looking at you know, variation. But I think with the loom weights, we're seeing this change from this fine wear through to coarse. And we see a kind of a similar picture with the mortaria as well. And I think this is something that we can maybe begin to look at. Um, but on a whole, I can't really comment at the moment, but this is something that we want to bring once we finish every uh, every single one of these projects to begin to explore. Um, yeah, definitely. It's something we'd like to, to focus on. Um, Fabric is visibly changing, that might suggest that might reflect other changes that are going on yep. that might feed back into how we understand the production process. Yeah, going on. I agree. I think it's, um, we're hoping that we can start <laughs> exploring this in the next steps of bringing everything together once we finish the individual <laughs> projects. So, yeah, watch this face. <laughs> This was a very popular question, changes over time. Oh, changes over time. <laughs> People have asked uh, uh, this. And uh, another question is, are you able to confirm if the clay you're sourcing is actually similar to the clay deposits that were taken from uh, during the period studied? Um, it's challenging. Um, oh, you might want to repeat that question. Oh, so uh, are we able to compare the clays that we're taking? Um, are we able, sorry. <laughs> um, are we able to uh, know if the That's clay you are uh, sourcing is actually similar to the clay deposits that we're taking from uh, during the period studies? So are we able to confirm whether the clays that we're taking are similar to the clays used in the past? Um, it's difficult. Like I said, the environments, the, um, the landscapes change quite dramatically, but we've focused, um, we've tried to focus at least with Guy on sampling materials from around the known kiln sites. So to ensure that we're seeing, because potters often try to source their material as close as possible. So we've been focusing on um, and adding to pre previously, these places haven't necessarily been sampled. Um, and including samples from places like the Brickworks, which although is a modern industry, trying to understand, um, yeah, the use of clays in the past. Yeah, it looks like you've got oodles of questions up there. Yeah, sorry, it's funny. Let me give you another one and then see. Okay, so um, one person asks, I'm wondering why you assume that potters made loom weights. Corinne has many people engaged in the production of architectural terracottas, most of which were uh, making molds. 
Yes. <laughs> um, we find examples of them in the production centers. I think that's safe to say, Bella. Um, they're incredibly standardized. We're seeing uh, maker's marks, um, which are consistent over entire kind of sets and large bodies of material. Um, I'm not saying that every single one of them is made by potters, I think, but I think um, the scale of the production at Corinth, I'm looking at Bella, <laughs> but I'm saying the right thing, um, is um, evidence that we're seeing potters producing these materials. And you said you to find a potter. So yes, exactly. We find them at the tile works. Yeah, so we find them at the tile works. Um, yeah. Uh, are there questions in the room or should we go the online people? Let's go for another online one. Wait, the thing's number is introducing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, uh, is the hypothesis of a dense ceramic production landscape and the suggestion of the presence of lots of workshops from Corinth to Sikian really so surprising. We have 10 plus more workshops for several kilometers between Athens and the academy area and the uh, small town of Locri, a Bizefri in southern Italy. has 10 plus excavated workshops in a small area. So uh, is it surprising to suggest that we have a lot of workshops? Is that a common? Um, I mean, it's, I'd imagine it's not surprising, but I think it's something that sadly hasn't been, hmm? it hasn't, it hasn't been um, discussed, in fact, in this region. And it's something that we're trying, each of these places have been um, addressed individually, or a specific body of material has been addressed individually. And we're trying to build this picture up by combining the work of others and ours to understand this region as a whole. So it's not it's not surprising by any means, but it's something that we're hoping to kind of expand on and understand in a better way. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> well, just, just an observation that to go back to this last question, the difference is that you're working on a regional scale, but the two examples of the person who wrote the question has in mind are actually quite localized. Yeah. And so that also might be if we don't know what would happen if we could start doing those regional studies on these other areas. Yes. Yeah. I'm not yes. sure we can do that kind of regional study for Africa and Africa. No, and it's really remarkable. Yeah. For rather obvious reasons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think it's quite remarkable, actually, the amount of work that we're able to build together along this region and the work that has been completed it, it's it gives us a much fuller picture than we are able to you're correct and that we can't see in other places because we simply aren't able to or or it hasn't been um worked on we also then brings up the, the further question we're going to have to ask not yet but down the line yeah of whether we want to think of this as typical or atypical yeah but that's that's yeah no i agree <laughs> Uh, okay. I wonder, yeah, some, some people will ask the same question. Okay. 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 Any questions in the audience? Someone Okay. That's why there are so many there. They're all saying well done. <laughs> are, there, are there questions for Carmacha? No? Is that okay? <laughs> oh, 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 I thought I was okay. safe. <laughs> Carlos was imagining the big If you have found any stamps like these uh, ones in blue, which is any transport of the right? Oh. Bella? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, folks, I think um, we should congratulate Carlos and ourselves for such a fantastically wide ranging but beautifully contextualized talk. And I think a lot of what she was talking about will stay with us in the weeks to come when we start thinking about work that we're looking at ourselves too. So thank you very much, Carlotta.